Okay, my name is uh, Tony Jones, and I am a senior software engineer in the performance group at SUSE Labs. And our primary responsibility is uh, basically kernel side, uh, finding kernel bugs, uh, detecting kernel performance bugs, fixing kernel performance bugs, working on the tooling to help us uh, find kernel performance problems. Uh, I am based in uh, Portland, Oregon, which is the true home of real beer. So uh, come and visit. Uh, yep, anyway, there's my email there. So if you have any questions about the talk or whatever, just find me an email. So can I, can I take this? So the first uh, thing to bear in mind is that performance analysis is not easy. So if you find yourself having to do it, go easy on yourself. Uh, it's extremely subjective. Lots of different, uh, two different people can have two different opinions regarding what is fast, what is slow. If you have a performance problem, generally regressions are the easiest thing to do. You can run the performance monitoring tools. You can, in conjunction with the bisection, you can just go and find the problem and fix the code. But if you have to take it from the other direction, which is that uh, it's brand new code you've never seen before, it's code that's worked before fine, but now you're running on new hardware, it can be a challenge. In that case, there's a whole bunch of what are called performance uh, analysis methodologies. Basically, we're talking about a procedure something to keep you on the right track, stop you from running around in the weeds. Uh, lots of different uh, methodologies, different degrees of formality. So uh, it's kind of a topic outside of this talk, but you can go Google and look for them. Uh, bottom line, be methodical. Uh, if you have to do infrequent analysis, what I recommend is what I call the Bugzilla methodology which is basically go and do the steps that we would expect from you if you were filing a bug with SUSE. So try and quantify the problem at the top level. Whole system feels sluggish, particular component feels sluggish. Uh, just try and break it down. If you can't quantify it, then you have to ask yourself, well, why do I think there's a performance problem? Uh, is it new or is it, or, or is it always been there? You obviously, you only make one config change at a time on the system, so what's changed recently on the system? Uh, does it occur on particular hardware? And so on. Uh, you don't have to know every single command line option, but it's very useful to know what tools exist. Also, the documentation can be thin to non-existent, it can be wrong. So don't be scared to write code. If you think the performance tools are saying, okay, in this situation we'll do this, and in this situation we'll report this, don't be scared to dig in, write yourself some code, test out your hypothesis, tweak the code, keep on going like that so you can say, oh, when I write my code to estimate cache misses, then the performance tools tell me this information. And that's pretty useful just to practice before you ever have to actually dig in. And if you do dig in, you can always do the Blame another group methodology, which is really good. Uh, so there are lots of tools. Uh, Perf is only one, and it is not the first one you're going to want to use. If you think you have some kind of performance issue on your system, the number one place to stop is dmessage, syslog. Look and see if you have any particular unusual entries in your logging. After that, the standard top utility get an idea if it's CPU bound, if it's user space, kernel space. If it's not CPU bound, then uh, dig into the IOSTAT, VMSTAT type tools, get an idea about uh, what the virtual memory and IO behavior is. And then finally, strace using the ptrace API is an extremely useful tool for getting an idea about system call behavior and system call latencies. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, performance counters. So in the old days, uh, you tend to use tools like Prof, which were real basic profilers, bucket-based software profilers. These days, if you want to do something like that, you're better off using Valgrind. Uh, so basically, it's a hardware resource to aid in performance analysis. It's been available on the x86 since Pentium 3. Uh, availability is through the CPU ID instruction and the uh, MSRs, the model specific registers. 
You'll see this term arc perfmon used a lot. Uh, it basically stands for architectural perform uh, perfmon, which is basically means that Intel has agreed that this will be available in future architectures. And that provides about seven or eight counters. Uh, by standardized, because the microarchitectures are different, it means that it exists, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be implemented in exactly the same way. Uh, and beyond this, each separate microarchitecture, so that's Nehalem, Broadwell, Haswell, etc., implements a whole slew of uh, microarchitecture-specific uh, counters. Each uh, microarchitecture has different numbers of performance counters, and so on. So uh, taking a step back, uh, so Perfmon 2.0 was the first in-tree uh, subsystem that used performance monitoring hardware. And that was designed by HP for Itanium. And it's still in the kernel tree as of today for Itanium. Uh, and it was extended for other architectures, specifically x86-64 uh, in uh, 2008. And the interesting thing about Perfmon was that nearly all of the logic was pushed into the libraries. So there was a library called libpfm and uh, a tool called pfmon, and the actual kernel side was very small. And that got submitted to uh, LKML in uh, 2008. And this fact, there's been a lot of controversy over the years about tools that live out of tree. And also, uh, Perfmon exposed most of the counter complexity to the users under the theory that it was complex anyway, so don't try and hide it. And there was a counter proposal uh, that came out almost afterwards, which was called Performance Counters for Linux, which was a single syscall based interface with nearly all the complexity pushed into the kernel, and the tool was not out of tree. The tool lived in tools perf. And so that got merged into the kernel 2009, Performance Counters for Linux, kernel version 2631. And it's now known by the almost ungoogleable uh, term perf events. And it is a Swiss army knife uh, of functionality, but mostly it's focused on CPU usage, uh, tracing, but it can also be a benchmarking tool. You can also use it for statistical analysis. So we're gonna talk mostly about perf now. So curious, how many people here have actually used Perf. Okay, how many would you think, how many would you think are ex reasonably expert in it? Okay, okay, well, that's good. So, where to begin? First thing, install it. We package it as an RPM for OpenSUSE, Tumbleweed, uh, you know, Leap, uh, SLES releases. And uh, like similar tools like uh, uh, Zipper and Git, it exposes a hierarchical command interface. So first thing you want to do is type in perf help, and that will list you all the different subcommands. And there are many of them, but these ones here are the most likely ones that you're going to typically encounter. Perf top is pretty much like the uh, Unix top utility. List will list you the events. Record is a sampling interface. Report is a uh, reporting tool. Annotate will give you source code annotation. Trace is the trace point interface. And there's one more that I forgot which I shouldn't have, is perf stat, which we'll talk about a lot. So the first thing that you're going to do is run perf list, and this is going to produce a lot of output. And I've pretty much sliced it away here with these ellipses. Uh, but you'll see what's happening here is the perf is aggregating many different event sources into this event list. So you have hardware events here, you have software events, hardware cache events, raw events, and trace point events. The hardware events are the events exposed by the performance monitoring hardware, the same as the hardware cache events. The software events are pseudo events that are being exposed by the kernel. So in this case, context switches. The raw events are uh, a way of specifying the raw hex code to access the low level performance counter events. And trace point events are a way for the existing ftrace infrastructure to be exposed uh, into perf. So obviously, most people are probably familiar with ftrace. It's a static, uh, static uh, trace point feature in the kernel where particular points of interest have been uh, marked, and then it's a, a low-cost tracing, if enabled, to uh, basically dump data to a ring buffer. 
So one thing we notice here is we see, we see under the hardware events, we've got cache misses, CPU cycles, or cycles, and instructions. These are what is termed an event moniker. So that's basically an alias for an event. You won't find these in any Intel uh, documentation whatsoever. They're basically, this gets to the issue of perfmon and perf, and they wanted to basically abstract the event names so that it was easy for users to use, so I didn't have to know what the hell was my uh, event type. So on this machine I'm running, which is a Xeon E5, if I look in Sys Devices CPU events, I will find a file called CPU Cycles, which matches that event moniker. And if I cat that, I will get the value 0x3c. Now I mentioned that a libpfm still exists. That was the library from Perfmon. And it got repurposed into a kind of higher level wrapper over Perf to help you decode events. And so the command user bin show event info comes from a libpfm develop package. So if you install that, if we run it, it dumps all of our events out to a file. And if I open that file, and I search for OX3C, I will get this entry here. And the interesting things about this is, first thing you can say is the PMU name. So it's, a arc, it's one of the ARC Perfmon events. So this is one of the architectural events that Intel has guaranteed will be available uh, on the hardware. Uh, there's a description, count core clock cycles whenever the clock signal on the specific core is running. So it's, if it's not running if the CPU is halted. And it's also worth mentioning that it's uh, subject to frequency scaling. So if you want to count at the reference cycle rate, constant rate, use the ref cycles event instead. By comparison, this is the same information from an Octoron uh, AMD system. So we can see in this case that the event is OX76. So the point I'm trying to tell you here is that there's not apples and apples. So even though you might be monitoring CPU cycles on multiple different machines, they're mapping to uh, multiple different underlying event representations. Sometimes on the Intel architecture, these will map to architectural Perfmon events. Sometimes they will map to uh, microarchitectural events that are microarchitecture, Haswell, Broadwell specific. Now, so each uh, microarchitecture has a different number of actual counters that can be running at a particular point in time. Sometimes there's one, sometimes there's two, sometimes there's four. And these counters work in basically, the same counter works in two distinct ways. One is what's called a counted interface, and one is what's called a sample interface. So the counted interface is basically begins counting, and it counts the number of occurrences of that low-level event that have occurred over a period of time. The sample interface is a little bit different. There's a bit in the counter which, when set, when that counter overflows around zero, will generate a local APIC interrupt. And what happens then is that the instruction pointer, uh, in effect, when that a counter overflowed is taken. So basically we can load a particularly high value into the counter, start it running, allow it to overflow, and get the instruction pointer that was in use at the time that counter overflowed. And we use that to implement the sampling interface whereby we can sample so many times per second to get an idea where the program counter is over time. Uh, the frequency for the sampled interface can be specified in two different ways. So. The first way is minus F, which says take this many samples per second. The documentation will tell you that that's by default is 1024. It's not. Changed several years ago to be 4096. Minus C says instead of doing X number of samples per second, generate a sample every X occurrences of the underlying event. So if I did minus C 1000 cycles, that would say generate me a sample every 1000 low level cycle events from the hardware. So, first time we're going to use one, run one of the commands, perf top. So perf top is a sampling view. So perf top is using the sampling counters, uh, similar to the standard Unix top utility. So in this case here, the first thing to bear in mind is on this left-hand column here, we have the overhead. So what this is saying is that while this sampling was taking place, and a sample was taken 44.93% of the time, the sample was taken inside the kernel function raw spin lock. 36.76% of the time it was taken in the kernel function sync inode super block. So you look at this and you're like, oh my god, that's 44 and 36, that's almost 100, that's you know, super busy. It's not. You need to go back to top in this case. And in this case, I was running sync in a loop. And top will show you that, in fact, the CPU was 0.1% user, 
4.1% system. So what you want to do in this case is add the minus n option to perf top, and that will report you back, the app, in addition on an extra column, the absolute number of samples that, that were taken to come up with that 44% and 33%. However, sometimes it is CPU bound. This is an example of I was running uh, uh, OpenSSL speed, the default benchmark for OpenSSL. And it's come back and it said, okay, so 51% of the time we were in this DES function, 26% of the time we were in another DES function and so on down. And if I turn on the minus N option here, it would report two orders of magnitude more samples per second being taken. So it's important to know if you're looking at something in perf and you, and you get freaked out with the number of samples, go back and figure out, you know, is it actually CPU bound? If you're not CPU bound, then you're not gonna get very far poking around in perf top. So, yeah, so it's, also, so it's possible in, through perf top to annotate hot code. So there are three essential viewing modes in the perf utilities. The default view, which is a curses view, it's called TUI. There's a GTK view, or there's a standard IO view. And I'm using the standard IO view in all these examples just because it's, it's easier. But if you run perf top in the TUI or GTK view, it's gonna constantly refresh itself over time or with a certain delay. And it's possible to hit enter, if we go back. So if we, go, if, if we run in the, the graphics version, like move the cursor down and uh, on the 51.02% and hit enter, it would, it would open up a window and let me do an annotation view of the source code. And that annotation view would show me line by line, assembly line and source line, where, the, where in that function these samples are being broken down. The problem with that is that it's refreshing in real time. And so you've lost your context from the top level as to what was hot code. So I don't tend to use, I'm, I'm not talking about it, but I don't tend to use perf top very much. Another thing is enabling call graphs can be really useful. So what's happening with the sampling interface is it's sampling the instruction points. So that's telling you, okay, I'm, a, I'm, I'm landing in this function, but it's not telling you why you are landing in this function. So enabling the minus G option to perf top, to perf record, every time the instruction pointer is taken from the APIC interrupt, it will also take the stack trace. So then when you're looking in the graphical tools, you can determine multiple paths. It'll show you the separate paths on the stack that reach something. Uh, and the reason I'm not talking about this much is there's a later slide on what's called flame graphs. And flame graphs are a much better way of trying to visualize this call graph data, and I'll show you that later on. The other thing is getting call graphs working reliably is problematic. So basically it depends if your code is built with a frame pointer or not. Most user space code is. Our SUSE kernels are not because we want that register available for general register allocation use because that gets us about a five to 10% performance gain. So we instead <laughs> run the unwinder, uh, which is, has an interesting history. Uh, and that's great for uh, oops, decoding oopses and decoding uh, panics, but it's not great uh, running 4,000 times a second inside the NMI handler. So this can have some problems. So if you're doing a lot of call graph analysis using the minus G option, you may want to build yourself a custom kernel. So, I run perf top usually very infrequently. I'll fire it up. If I think I'm CPU bound, I'll fire it up. I'll get a very brief idea about what the display is showing me. And then I will run perf record. And perf record is, again, a sampling using this, the counter sampling. And there are three primary different command line options here, there's perf record command, perf record minus A command, and perf record minus A. The first one of these is going to record samples only when, in user space and kernel space by default, only when command is running, and only on the CPU that command is running on. Minus A command is going to record samples when command is running, but it's also going to record it on all CPUs, so you can see if there's any other side effects coming from other CPUs while command is running. And perf record minus A is just going to sample the entire system regardless of command on all CPUs. The default scope is to sample in kernel and user mode. So by default, uh, CPU cycles is the default event. If you don't want to sample in user and kernel mode, you can use the U or the K qualifier after the event. And that tells the system, in this case, 
sample CPU cycles only for user space and only when command is running on the CPU. So an example. So in this case, we're doing perf record, which is the sampling interface. I'm not doing frequency sampling. Instead, I'm saying, generate me a sample every 1,000 occurrences of the low-level event called instructions, only sample for user space, and I'm running the Limpack benchmark. And the first thing I do after that is I say, okay, perf report minus D. So what happens is perf report generates you a file in your current directory called perf.data containing the sample, sampling information that was collected. Perf report interprets that file. So perf report minus D just dumps it out in ASCII form. And I'm grepping for the number of occurrences of the, the, the word perf record sample. So there's 3,048,011 samples that were taken in that perf.data file. Now if we run perf report, we're using the minus N option, which is asking us to give us the absolute sample count as well as the overhead. And I'm using the standard IO viewer. You will notice that we have a much larger event count. That event count is exactly 1,000 times the number of samples because I asked for a sample every 1,000 occurrences. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so we can see in this that the function DAXBR was 48% of the time a sample occurred that was that sam that was on the CPU. 40% uh, of the time the function DAXBUR was on the CPU. So, I had mentioned previously that if you were using the GTK view or the TUI view, you could automatically hit enter on one of those entries and it will take you into the annotation view. If you're running on, the, on a standard I.O. console, you can instead run the separate command called perf annotate. So, I've asked it perf annotate and I've asked it to annotate just the symbol DAXBR, which if we go back was, was the hot symbol 48.04% of the time samples were taken in that code. So I've asked perf annotate to annotate just that symbol for me. Because I built the code with minus G, I have the C source and the assembly course source interlaced with each other. And because I asked for the minus print line option, it is giving me the, the line numbers in the file that match. So on the left hand column here, we can see the, overhead, the sampling overhead relative to the 48% of the previous slide. So we can see that this line down here, we've got 10.31% on this add instruction, 1037 on this move, 17.5% on this move SD. And what this shows us is that all of these assembly lines are related to line 599 in the source code, which is this DYI equals DYI plus DA times DX instruction. So what this is allowing us to do is look at our record data and then basically drill it into a source level annotation view and get an idea about what is actually the hot code on a line-by-line -line basis. Now, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so the previous example, okay, so the previous example, I ran perf record minus C1000 minus E instructions colon U. So I asked it to sample only in user space. In this case, I've dropped my restriction on that. So I've asked it to sample in user and kernel space while this task, so I've, I don't have minus A, so I'm only limiting the sampling to the CPU that Limpack is running on. But what we see now is the same thing, DAXBR, DAXBUR is still the hot code. The dot in brackets means it's a user space sample, but now we have some kernel samples occurring. And if we look at them, so we've got bottom half processing, we've got some soft IRQ processing, we've got some IRQ processing, idle CPU. So we don't, what we don't have is any syscalls, which is not surprising because Linpack is a floating point benchmark. If we were running a bunch of syscalls out of this task, we would see a lot of syscalls showing up in these kernel samples. So one of the common questions you get asked is, well, okay, great, I've got these performance counters and I've got all these events, but what events do I monitor? So I'm gonna talk briefly about that. One of the most common things you're gonna to wanna to monitor is what's called instructions per cycle. So all of these CPUs are pipeline superscalar machines. So basically there's multiple steps as you just fetch the instruction from memory, decode it, execute it, fetch the memory operands and do the write back. And these are all occurring in separate stages in the pipeline. And if there's enough instruction level parallelism, 
it will try to fill the pipeline and you can execute more than one instruction per cycle. This is a common enough usage of these two events. We've asked perf stat, and this is the first time we've seen perf stat. Perf stat is the counted interface. So it is not doing sampling. Instead, it is giving me the number, the absolute count of the events that occurred while the task was running. And I've asked it to limit its sampling to just user space for the events, instructions, and cycles. And this is a common enough comparison the perf actually averages this out for us automatically and comes back and says, okay, in this case, this task ran and had 2.73 instructions per cycle. So the more instructions per cycle, the better you are. Another thing that is useful is cache misses relative to cache references. So I have a genius piece of code here, and what it does is it basically allocates a array, a million elements, times a multiplier times the size of int, which is eight. So when multi is one, that's an eight million byte allocation. When multi is eight, that's a 64 megabyte allocation. It allocates that on the uh, heap, and then it runs a loop uh, randomly writing all over that array. The purpose is to test what the cache miss, cache hit reference is. So once again, on the bottom here, we can see down here, we run perf stat, we're asking for the cache misses event moniker for user space only, the cache references uh, moniker for events only. And again, this is a common enough comparison that Perf's gonna do the averaging for us, and it says we have a cache miss rate of 54%. So one thing to bear in mind, so the reason I did this, the machine I was running this on was an E5 2420v2, and it has a quarter meg L2 cache per core, and 1.5 meg L2 cache on the die, and then a 15 meg last level cache L3. So I've got a 15 megabyte last level cache, and I'm doing an eight, a 64 megabyte allocation when multi is eight. If I drop mult down to one, that results in me having an eight megabyte allocation, which entirely fits within the 15 meg last level cache, and in that case, it reports 0.001% cache misses. If I change mult to two, which in this case I'm 16 megs, so I'm slightly outside my cache size, I get a 0 0.003 miss rate. Now, I had said earlier when we looked at the output of perf list, there was something called raw events. These are events that are not described by default in the perf list output. So once again, I'm running the show event info command from the libpfm devel package. And I'm looking, I'm looking at this particular event, and it is mem load uops retired. One thing to note, it is an Ivy Bridge specific microarchitectural event, so it is not part of the architected perfmon. And it's counting memory load uops retired, and there are a bunch of umask qualifiers that I can specify to give me level one hits, level two hits, level three miss, misses, and so on. So I just have a short loop here saying, uh, run user bin event to raw, which is the decoder, which will decode mem load uops retired colon L2 hit, and it'll give me the raw event back for those. So I run that, and it gives me the four raw events, 5302D1, 5310D1, 5304D1, 5320D1. And I can now run perf stat specifying those four raw events, again, scoping each one to user space, and it comes back and tells me that I have just uh, almost 3 million L2 hits to the L2 cache, 412 million misses on the L2 cache, 187 million L3 hits, 224 million L3 misses. Now one thing that's really important about this is this last column down here in percentages. So I mentioned that each uh, microarchitecture has a different number of performance counters. So this one actually has four performance counters, but not all performance counters can run all events. And it turns out on this system, these performance counters for these particular events, only two of them can run the events. So I have four events, two counters that can run them. So the kernel is time slicing. While bad cache is running, 50% of the time on one counter, it's using 5302D1. 50.01% of the time, it's running 5310D1 and so on. So the kernel's telling you here, these are the ratios of the time that the actual event was physically running on the counter, and then it scales the, the numbers up to give you uh, the effect of it running 100% of the time. So if you don't like that, 
your options are to do multiple runs with, with uh, fewer counters or pick a different event which can run on more of the, of the performance monitoring counters. Another thing that is worth monitoring is branch misses relative to branch instructions. So we talked about the CPU being pipeline. So the goal is to keep the pipeline full. When the CPU encounters a conditional branch, it has to say to itself, well, I want to keep the pipeline full. How do I do that? It does that by trying to predict which of the two ways you'll go in the conditional branch statement. And then it starts loading into the pipeline the instructions from the, de from the target of the destination branch that is predicted. So if that fail, if that branch prediction fails and you take the other branch, the kernel has to eject those instructions out of the pipeline. So that, and that affects uh, your instructions per cycle. So here we have some code again, 1,024, a million times 20 cycles of this code. And all this, co all this code up here in the top is doing, I just abbreviated it so it fit on the slide, it's basically just a randomized eight-way branch. So each time we run through this code, we will randomly take one of the eight possible branches to try and make it hard for the branch predictor to work. And so we run it using perf stat, and we specify the branches moniker for user space and the branch misses moniker for user space. And I don't get back the results I thought I was going to get because I've got 490 million branches and 19 million branch misses. And I'm calling this function func 20 million times. So I was expecting way more. The reason, anybody know the reason? The reason is that I am asking stat to count me the events that occurred for the entire execution of the function branch 8x. So back in this thing here, I have eight, 20 million calls to RAND. I have 20 million conditional branches occurring for that for loop. So what this is doing is this is basically skewing the results. So I have a huge number of branches that are taking place. But the ones that I want to monitor up here, there's no way to do that because perfstat is giving me the counted number of events for the entire code execution. So we'll talk later about a way. Uh, oh, no, actually. We'll talk later about this with Pappy, but one thing we can do instead of using the counted interface is run the same task, but instead run the sampled interface. So instead of running perf stat, we're gonna run perf record. We have no minus F option, so by default it's gonna take 4,096 samples per second. We're asking it to sample branches and branch misses for user space only. And it comes back and it tells us, okay, so in this execution, 42.5%, I had 42.5% of the total branch instructions executed were in the function func. 21% of the total branches executed were in the function main, but 73.3% of all of the misses were in func and only 23% were in main. So this is showing us kind of what we were hoping to show, which is that the effects of the forcing the branch prediction to fail inside a function func, we see a much higher number of branch miss misses as a percentage. There is something called sampling skew or skid. And what that means is we talked about, uh, we talked about using the sampling uh, counters and when the counter overflows, it records the instruction pointer. Because of the way that the pipelining is taking place, the instruction pointer is not always guaranteed to be correct. It can be a few instructions off. So if you're looking at your assembly level uh, deep, uh, code output in perf annotate, the sample could be showing the wrong instruction. There was a way to solve that. On Intel, it's called PEBS, precise event-based sampling. On AMD, it's called uh, IBS, instruction-based sampling. Uh, and uh, basically what happens is, we looked previously, we could do the colon U or the colon K qualifier on an event. There's also a precision qualifier, a P, a PP, and a PPP. And what this says is, if you specify, say, CPU cycles colon P, it says, okay, I accept that the skid, but when you give me the skid, when you give me the fact that the IP is off by a little bit, make it off by the same amount every time. Number two says, please give me zero skid. I don't like zero skid, but, but the kernel is free to not give you that. And three is, I require zero skid. So right now, only uh, one, zero, one, and two are supported uh, in perf. 
Now, if you also, not every event supports PEB. So again, if you run the show event info command that we've been using many times, you will see a keyword in there, precise, as the flags for that counter. And that means that it supports PEBs. So, moving ahead. So remember, we looked at the output of perf list, and we had, we had software events, we had hardware events, and we also had trace points. So these are the static ftrace code points that the kernel developers have deemed to be of interest uh, to debugging code. So if I do perf list trace point on my system, I get 1,486 different entries for existing kernel trace point events. So I've just uh, broken it down and chopped a bunch out here. But we have uh, block IO uh, back merge from the block subsystem. We have sked colon sked switch which is invoked whenever the scheduler performs a task switch. And for every syscall in the system, we have a trace point for its entry and a trace point for its exit. And also, what we have is a file in syskernel debug tracing events, and then the event name called format. And if we cap that file under the print here, that shows us what the kernel is going to output into the ring buffer for ftrace every time that trace point is active. I don't think, uh, if it's enabled. So, we can do some cool things with, so this, this, uh, these trace points are primarily for, the, for using ftrace, but perf integrates with them. So this first command is using the counted interface, perf stat, and it says, okay, minus A, so I want system wide. I want you to, re to record system wide every time the sys enter star Trace point. So this is a glob. So, so every time any entry point for any system call is encountered, I want you to count that and sleep 30. So over 30 seconds, basically tell me how many times a system call was entered, system wide. Shoot. Is this uh, matching with the wide done on the kernel or in the user land? That is, uh, in the user land. In user land. Because, uh, because it actually expands out and you'll actually get a line in the output per syscall. So it's been done in user land. Good question. The next one of these, I've dropped the minus A. So I'm not doing system-wide anymore. I'm perf stat, so give me a counted count of the number of times that the sked switch event was occurred while benchmark was running. So how many times did the scheduler run to, to involuntarily context switch me out while benchmark was running? Now you might say to yourself, okay, so we've got these trace points. They're in the kernel. They're in fixed locations in the kernel. So why would I have any interest in running perf record? Because perf record is a sampling based interface that samples the instruction pointer uh, a certain number of times a second. But I already know where these trace points are, so it's not a lot of interest in sampling the instruction pointer, as I already know. But it does have a use. In this case, I'm doing perf record minus A, so I'm sampling system wide. I've asked it to give me call stacks. So every time an instruction pointer is taken, it'll, it'll give me the stack that led to that point. Syscalls, sys enter write, so the event is the entry point for the write syscall. And now we go back to that format file I talked about in the previous slide. And this is the format that's output here, and one of the fields is count. And that is your count argument to your, to your write syscall. And so I can add an optional filter onto that. So what this is saying is, sample me 4,096 times per second, no, sorry, sorry. Sample me uh, every time the Cisco enter write trace point is encountered system wide, but only when the count argument is greater than 1024. And for each of those, show me the kernel trace that led us to that trace point. So that can be a really useful use case for using perf record together with trace points. Now, yeah. Uh, do you have any, any idea or can you tell us how much? Running this tool with system-wide impact all It does, but ftrace is designed to be extremely low overhead. So, I mean, you're only monitoring, uh, you're only activating one uh, trace point at that point. I mean, you're only activating the sys write trace point. If you did, uh, if you asked it to filter every single syscall, that's going to have an effect. And if you enable every single event, it's going to have an effect. But ftrace is designed to be low overhead. So it is, it, is, it is significantly less overhead than you would think. It's designed to be turned on and produce lots and lots and lots of data with minimal system effect. But obviously, not zero. Yeah. Clear. Yeah. 
So uh, these, these trace points are, are important, useful enough that there's actually a perf subcommand called perf trace. And this is basically doing the same thing as s trace, but it's not using the ptrace uh, API. And that has some interesting side effects. Number one, it is way lower overhead than ptrace. ptrace has huge overhead. It can monitor system-wide. We've already seen that. You can do minus A. With strace, all you can do is run a particular command or attach to an existing command. And it can filter based on syscall duration. So what I've got going on here is I've got a DD command, reading from dev0, writing to slash temp, 1k block size, 10 writes. And I ask it, perftrace, to, to tell me the syscalls that have a duration of longer than one microsecond. And it comes back and it says none of them did. Now, in the end, I add on to the end of it here, con v equals f data sync. And what that says is that when you're finished, do a sync syscall. So here we see one line of output now. Uh, 6.035 milliseconds in duration, a sync call took place. And finally, instead of doing f data sync, I can say o flag equals sync. What that says is I want you to do synchronous writes all the time for data and metadata. Every, every write should be fully synchronous. So now when I run it, every single write syscall comes back 6.127 milliseconds for the first, and then the rest of them are all over one millisecond. So this is an example of using perf trace, which is basically using these lower level trace point events to automatically give me an idea about what syscalls are taking place on the system. There is also a really cool minus s option, which will give me a summary of all of the system calls. So it produces this table here of how many system calls, the total, the minimum run, the maximum run, the deviation, and so on for all of the syscalls that were executed during this run. Finally, uh, so I said these ftrace trace points are predetermined by the kernel developers. If you want to add another one, you need to go into the kernel source code, you need to put in a new trace point. Sometimes you don't want to do that. Sometimes I want to just dynamically monitor something new. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm running perf probe copy from user. Copy from user is the kernel code point that copies data across the syscall boundary from user space. So I do perf probe, copy from user, and it comes back and it adds what's called a k probe. And it comes back and says, okay, this probe is now called probe colon underscore copy from user, and you can run it in the sampling interface if you want to. Instead, I chose to, to run it in the counted interface, perf stat minus a, and a duration of one second. So what this says to me is how many times in a one second period system-wide system did we enter the copy from user function? Finally, last slide on, uh, on the basic stuff, perf script. So remember we said perf record produces a perf .data file in your current directory which perf record operates on. Perf script by default will produce an ASCII dump of that perf.data in a format suitable for parsing with, with uh, other tools. Now, there are already a bunch of pre-canned scripts on the system. And you can look, if you want on your system now, you can do perf script minus L, and it will list you these pre-canned Python and Perl scripts that have already been created. So you say, well, I'd like to write a new command. And that sounds kind of daunting, because I don't know what's going on. Fortunately, there's a great option, perf script minus G, Python or Perl. And what that'll do is it'll open the perf.data file and it will look at what types of events are recorded in that perf.data file. And it will generate you a skeleton Python or skeleton Perl script with an entry point for each one of those events. So all you have to do then is go fill it in with whatever code you want to do. And then you can install it into the system. And then you can use that script by saying perf script record your script name, perf script report your script name. And, and you can have that script built into the system. Okay, so, any questions? Okay, so I've got some advanced stuff that I wanted to talk about. We went back to that, remember we talked about that uh, slide where we first talked about call graphs and how they were problematic? One of the problems with call graphs is that there can be so much data that you can't make sense of it in the annotation view. So perf annotate, remember, was the command we ran and it broke it down by uh, line number. But there's so much data that it's just not, you just can't figure out what's going on. So a guy called Brendan Gregg, who's a performance analyst at Netflix, has come up with this thing called Flame Graphs, and that's the URL there. So what we do is we run the record interface system-wide, minus G, so I want call graphs. The event is cycles, kernel space only sampling, and I'm running an SCP of a 10 gig file from my workstation to another host. 
After that, we end up with a perf.data file in our current directory. We could do perf report on that if we wanted. Instead, we do perf script. We pipe it to these two scripts that Brandon's come up with. And that produces an interactive SVG file that we can open in Firefox. And it looks like this. So this is a flame graph. So this is a graph. Uh, it's kind of complicated. Each box here, don't worry about the colors. They're not actually very meaningful. But each box is a, a entry on the stack. And your y-axis is reflecting the depth of stack. So higher entries are children, lower entries are parents. And the x-axis doesn't show time in the normal sense that we'd expect it to do. Instead, it's, the x-axis is alphabetically sorted, and what it shows is the amount of time, the amount of time in terms of number of samples that that stack entry showed up on the stack. So the bottom entry here is our main function. So sure enough, 100% of the time, it showed up on the stack at the bottom entry. And then the next entry on the stack, half the time was one option, the other half the time it was swapper. And what tends to happen is it'll form these peaks here. And what those indicate is that, in this case here, TCP v4 receive doesn't in fact do a lot of work itself. Mostly it accumulates samples from its children running uh, below it. But occasionally we'll get entries like this guy here. So we're interested in looking at leaves like this. So that leaf there is on the top of the stack, so it's hot for a significant number of samples because the x-axis is a number of samples. And that's copy from user. So obviously we're running a SCP of a 10 gig file, we're sucking the data out of the file system, we're sending it over the network. So, so we're interested, this shows us basically a breakdown of all of the paths, and that is extremely useful if you're trying to get a high level visualization of your core graph data. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is something called PAPI or self-monitoring. PAPI is the Performance Application Programming Interface. And that's, it, it's hosted at that, at that URL there. And it used to, originally was intended to run over Perfmon. And then when Perfmon kind of ran into a brick wall, it got retasked to run over Perf. But because it was running over Perfmon and Perfmon exposed you the raw event names and Perf doesn't do that, they came up with their own different event aliases called event presets that have no correspondence with the Perf ones. But what Pappy allows you to do is a library. It allows you to insert calls from your code into particular points in your, in your source code, say, okay, start running these counters now. Okay, at this point in the code, uh, read, read this counter, do some work, read this counter again, and subtract the difference and report the results to me. So if you remember back to that example function we had a few slides back where we had a function called func. Remember we had that eight-way branch in there and we tried to run perf stat on it and we got a huge number of results. So if the obvious thing you do then is say, okay, well, let's just put a pappy call above the eight-way branch saying, read me the counters. I'll do my eight-way branch, and then I'll do another call uh, to Pappy again to read the counters, and then I'll display the difference. Unfortunately, that doesn't work either, because the library calls to Pappy have an enormous number of branches in them. So Pappy can, is somewhat useful for, uh, for putting around code pieces inside your own code, but it has limitations. There is an excellent kernel implementation that was added in these two mainline commits. And if you want to know how that works, you need to look in the self-test code, and there's a, a file called uh, testsrdpmc.c in the kernel source code. And what this code basically does is maps a kernel page for consistency, and then allows you to directly call rdpmc from your user space code. But you can only do it for your, to monitor yourself. You can't monitor anybody else. But the advantage that is way too complicated to talk about here, but the advantage it has is that the code is, is not a library code. So you can, you've got an idea about the overhead of that code and how it's going to perturb the performance counter results that you're getting. Uh, oh, and there's an excellent paper by Vince Weaver, uh, who's one of the Pappy developers. This paper here, if you're interested, is worth reading all about the performance overhead of Perf uh, versus Perfmon. Another thing that's worth talking about is off CPU analysis. So all the stuff we've been talking about so far is I'm running on the CPU, so I'm monitoring events, I'm monitoring cache misses, I'm monitoring branch misses relative to branch instructions. And that's really interesting stuff, but sometimes it's just as interesting to find out why my code is not running. And generally speaking, the goal of your code is I want my code scheduled and running on the CPU as often as possible. So there are lots of reasons why your code won't be running. 
There's disk I.O. You've got some kind of task-to-task -task synchronization going on. The effects of the virtual memory subsystem on your code or involuntary context switching. So there's a really excellent analysis here. Uh, Brandon Gregg has written this paper which shows how to use perf trace plus perf inject to monitor the scheduling system calls. And you can produce flame graphs using this approach showing the effects of the scheduler on your code and how much time your code is off the CPU. So I'm just mentioning this here, it's an advanced topic, but it's just as important to know why you're not running as to know why you are running. And final slide. So virtualization. So if you're virtualizing, you need to virtualize all of this performance monitoring hardware under the, underneath the surface, and that is hard. So if you're in Zen and you're in DOMU and you run PerfList, you're gonna see software events, you're gonna see trace point events, but you're not gonna see any of the performance counter events because they're not virtualized. Things are better in QEMU if you're using uh, KVM, uh, which stands for Kernel Virtual Machine. So there's a wonderfully undocumented option. There's a minus CPU option on QEMU, so you could say minus CPU, uh, QEMU 64 is the default CPU, comma, PMU equals on. And that's, it's not documented anywhere that I could find. But what that does is that tells QEMU to uh, virtualize the CPU ID instruction to report back that yes, this CPU supports architectural perfmon V1 through V4. And so then in your host, you can do perf list and you will see those event monikers for CPU cycles and so on and so forth. You can also do minus CPU host, which fully exposes the underlying host hardware to QEMU. In that case, you can see your microarchitectural events also, so you can do the raw events that we showed. If you're stuck on Zen, there is slight salvation. There's a subcommand to perf called perf KVM. It does sampling only, so you cannot do the counted interface. It's only sampling. Uh, there's no visibility on individual guests. It can, it can break it down by host or guest cumulative but it allows you to basically do sampling of what's going on inside the host space or what's going on inside the guest space. It is kind of hokey though because you have to copy the symbols and module information file from your uh, host into the, uh, from your guest into the host, which is awkward. But if you're running Zen, perf KVM is about as far as you can go. If you're running KVM with QMU, things are a lot better, but remember it's being virtualized. so. The results may vary compared to uh, bare metal. Anyway, that's my talk. I hope it was okay. Any questions? No. <laughs> so you can use perf pretty much only if your workload is CPU bound. Otherwise, uh, you no, don't. No, that's not true at all. I mean, I, I, I refer to that. The, the question was, so you can use perf only if your workload is CPU bound. That is not true. I mean, uh, the perf trace points, for example, those are, if you expose the scheduler trace points and you use uh, perf commands, then you can expose a lot of information that, about the code that's running that has nothing to do with it being CPU bound. And I talked about the paper I would encourage you to read this paper here, because in this paper here, Brand, this page here, he talks about using perf trace and also perf inject to do similar to what you could do with system tap in terms of determining off CPU analysis. So determining when your code is not running on the CPU. So you can use perf in cases when it's not CPU bound. Now perf top, perf record, uh, perf stat are generally gonna be focused on uh, CPU bound code. But the perf trace and, and that side of things is nothing to do with being CPU bound. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Yes. So is perf completely multi-architecture aware then? Ah, oh, good point, yes. So it started off uh, being x86-64 only, but now pretty much, and that's one of the differences between Perfmon. So now you've got every architecture for uh, PowerPC, for ARM, for S390, for x86 stuck in the kernel tree in terms of logic of how to handle the underlying hardware counters for the microarchitectures. 
In Perf1, this was all stuffed out in libpfm. Now it's all stuffed in the kernel. But yes, it is. Uh, it's supported on S390, uh, PowerPC, uh, ARM, ARM64. Uh, it can be considered to be a general purpose replacement for O-Profile, basically. Uh, the one architecture it doesn't work on is IA64, and that is still using Perfmon. So there is no Perf for IA64. So if you find yourself working on that, you've got to go download libpfm and pfmon and, and uh, use that. If the code does not run on the CPU, mm -hmm. where can it run on? Like, what are the other scenarios? For instance, a GPU or, or what else? Yeah, uh, I must admit I don't know about the GPU case. Uh, I don't think that there is any support in there, any perf support for, for uh, analyzing the performance on GPUs. So, yeah, but... So basically, if it's not on the CPU, it's always on the GPU. No, if it's not if it's not on the CPU, then uh, you 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 could have, you're, you're you're being in the process of being scheduled. So you're you're mm -hmm. waiting for something. So you're on some sort of I/O wait channel. You're waiting for virtual memory. You're waiting. For, it's like I mentioned on this. Going back to this slide here. Oh, here. So there are many reasons why you may not be running on the CPU. Right? You might be waiting for disk I/O to complete. You've performed some kind of synchronization with another thread or another task, and you're waiting, waiting for that synchronization to complete. Uh, you've, you've performed some operation that's invoked a page fault, and you're waiting for that to come back. When that happens, the kernel's going to schedule you off the CPU, schedule somebody else onto the CPU who, who can run, rather than having you busy loop doing nothing. And the other thing is the kernel's going to schedule you off the CPU just because it's got 500 other tasks that it has to get on the CPU. So there's lots of times, so that's the main difference between, if you do perf record command and perf record minus a command, that's the primary difference. You're gonna see the effects of uh, the kernel in doing other bookkeeping type stuff while your command was running. Because one of the things that's gonna happen in the kernel while your command is running is that you're gonna be scheduled on and off the CPU. And if you don't do the minus a option, you you, if, you don't sample in the, sorry, if you don't sample in the kernel events, you won't see that. If you, stick, if you limit yourself to, to just uh, user space sampling. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot for clarifying. No, no, no you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> this is Giovanni, by the way. So. Hello, everybody. I've heard about another tool called Barclay Packet Filter. Yes. And, and uh, now there is uh, originally in the networking domain, but mm -hmm. now expanding towards yes. the performance monitoring. And I wanted to know what would be the overlap of... Uh, Excellent. I'm going to do a talk on that in the labs conference. But uh, it is way... That's way okay, what he's talking about is something called eBPF. So has anybody here run uh, TCP dump? Has anybody run that? So TCP dump used the old Berkeley packet filter which was, uh, and what happened in the kernel more recently is something called eBPF came up, which is basically a, a, a stack type programming language which is jitted inside kernel space. And so you can do all kinds of cool things inside this jitted code. Uh, and there is a new perf interface to eBPF that allows you to integrate, it's, it's, I could, could talk for three or four hours on perf, but there is a perf interface to, to eBPF and you can go look at it if you want. But it, yeah, there's also something called IPT, which is Intel Processor Trace, which is an extremely low level uh, processor tracing feature, which is integrated. There's, like I said, Swiss is a, a Perf is a Swiss army knife. There's a million and one different things it does. I just focused on the real basic stuff. But uh, eBPF is, a, is another uh, cool feature that Perf can use. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you very much.